Hello and welcome to Run Pass Opinion, the internet's newest web show, which focuses today on the Chicago Bears and the performance of their 2019 offensive line and what we think is going to happen for them in 2020 in the same unit. Now, I don't think I'm so much of an expert in offensive line, which is in and of itself a whole different world than, say, wide receivers, quarterbacks, defensive linemen, safeties, or defensive backs. And so for that reason, I've done a first on today's show, and I've actually brought in a guest, which is Windy City Gridiron's own Lester Wiltfong, offensive guru and boss over at Windy City Gridiron, which, if you're a Bears fan, you should absolutely check out the site. Lester, how are you doing today? Doing good, Robert. How you doing? I'm doing fine. It's good to be back talking Bears, even though, if we could be honest, we don't really know whether there's going to be a season yet, but fingers crossed and we'll remain hopeful. Now, when it comes to the 2019 offensive line, I know that that's a subject that has drawn a lot of ire with Bears fans, because honestly, as we know, when things go wrong, the offensive line is the first one to get the blame. But in your opinion, was the offensive line as bad as people said it was? And was there a difference in pass blocking, run blocking? What are your general thoughts? Yeah, I think generally speaking, the, the line wasn't, it wasn't clearly as good as it was in, 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 the, in the year prior. Um, I mean, there were some obvious issues from a scheme standpoint. I think that's one of the reasons why Matt Nagy revamped his entire offensive coaching staff, including uh, the O-line coach. You know, I just don't think he was happy with how the run game kind of got, got going the whole season. You know, a lot of fans, you know, wanted to go, you know, talk about the eye formation stuff. And, and the Bears did have a little success early with that. But honestly, when you look at the numbers, you know, they didn't run any better out of the eye than they did out of anything else the entire season last year. So... I mean, yeah, it looked nice at the time, and it, it feels good to go downhill when you can. But, but honestly, it didn't make that that big of a difference. Um, I think overall, the offensive line wasn't quite as bad as, as some fans make it out to be. Uh, it's almost to the point where, if you don't completely bash them and call them all trash and garbage, then then you're then you're wrong. Um, I mean, there is some middle ground there. You know, there was a lot of bad, but there was some good as well. And I think part of that is is scheme. I think part of that is just not having the same five guys in place for the whole season. And I think some of that falls on, on the quarterback as well. I'll tell you that I had exactly the same experience when it came to my own week-to-week -week grading. I know that in my review of the Rams game, which was uh, not a great offensive performance, we'll, we'll put it nicely there, I called for more eye formation along with plenty of people because against the Chargers and the Eagles, it had seemed to reap some real results. But I'll tell you what, Lester, based on what I could tell, the eye formation was just as unsuccessful, exactly like you said, the whole rest of the season. It seems as if the other teams looked at the tape they saw the bears were going to try to run the eye formation and they snuffed out whatever light flame the bears had going but you mentioned something that i think is really key here you talk about how you don't necessarily need to throw out all five members of the offensive line and i think that's as good a segue as into anything else when you go player by player on the offensive line who do you think actually needs replacing or worrying about? And which offensive linemen going into 2020 are you relatively comfortable with? And to what degree on each player? I mean, honestly, there, there's question marks pretty much at all five spots right now. But but like I said, you, you got to go back to what they were the year prior. Um, the offense was a little more fluid, a little more efficient in, in 2018. Um, you know, uh, Cody White here and, and Charles Leno Jr. both made the Pro Bowl. Um, I think uh, Charles Leno kind of got there maybe as a second or third alternate, but but when you look at his overall body of work, you know Charles Leno, it, it's it's funny because a lot of Bears fans they just don't like Charles Leno, and and it's funny because <laughs> the last time there was a good left tackle in Chicago that was like really good was Jimbo Covert back in the '80s. So as Bears fans, we haven't seen an elite left tackle. So by by us wondering you know why he can't be this elite Joe Thomas type of player, that's just not realistic. He's you know, he, he was actually, I just did a, a, a article about him. He was my, my, my number, my, my, my 10th guy in my, my top 10 most important bears for the, for the 2020 season. And, and, and in that article, I, I looked at his contract status and I think he's the 23rd uh, highest paid tackle in the league 23rd right now. 23rd highest paid. I mean, is that who he is? Is he in an, a middle of the pack average tackle? Probably when he's at his best, he wasn't at his best last season. That's the problem with Charles Leno. Um, you, you, you had a really good video about him, and I actually I, I had the video linked up in my article. There was some good, there was some bad. You know, he had kind of a, a, a tough start to the beginning of the season. Uh, he kind of he kind of got things right after the bye. Um, but then, like I mentioned in my article, he had a really bad Week 17 game, and, 
And yeah, as, he did. as fans, you know, we look at that and say, oh, and that's the last thing we know of him is, is seeing that that really horrible game that he had there. And so that, that's what's in our mind. But but overall speaking, Leno has the, the ability to bounce back. Um, and then you're going to go, you know, across the line. You have Daniels. If they're going to leave him at left guard, I think he's going to be fine. You know, me and you were talking a little bit a little, a little earlier tonight. And, you know, James Daniels was drafted at just at just 20 years old. You know he's 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 22 years old right now. He's still relatively young, you know, as as a as a man. And, and, and as far as his, his 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 playing goes in the NFL, you know, he has a lot to learn. Um, you know, he's still coming into his body. You know, believe it or not, I mean, you know, when he, that's one of the things that held him back coming in is the, the, the physicality of it. Um, but then you you had the problem where you're him and Cody White here mixing him up in the positions. I think it really stunted his development. I think moving forward, you know, you got to settle on him at left guard and just go from there. I'll tell you what, just before we go on through the rest of the offensive line, I can't agree with you enough. I understand Harry Heastand thought that he could transition Daniels to center successfully, but based on what Olin Krutz has said, based on my own personal film study, look, I don't know how much of a problem Mitch's issues with calling things at the line of scrimmage were, but Olin Krutz seems to suggest that they certainly were a problem. Games like Philadelphia and even Washington to a degree, if you pick apart different snap counts and alignments and so on and so forth, you can definitely tell that whether it's Daniels or Mitch or even just the combination of the two, the two struggled with really getting the line lined up and after they made the switch back to white hair at center and daniels at left guard things really seemed to improve from the giants game on certainly daniels fit that left guard spot much better than he did center and one thing that i'd love to hear your take on when it comes to james daniels because i think it's fair to say that between charles leno who we know who he is and i did a whole video on him cody Whitehair, who got paid for good reason and rashad coward who i mean he needs about as much replacing as anybody else. Maybe Bobby Massey, but James Daniels is really the lineman worth spending some time on here, don't you think? When it comes to his development going into now his third year, where I think you had it right, he'll be, what, 23? How much do you expect comfortability in that left guard spot to matter? And frankly, how much does it matter on the offensive line in general? Yeah, it's all about the continuity on the O-line. You want your five guys, you know, we always say it's a team within a team. You want those five guys to be within. You know, there's so much that happens, you know, from the guy next to you to knowing what he's going to do, knowing how he's going to feel a stunt, knowing how he's going to feel a double team, you know, knowing when it's time to come off and go to the second level. And, and you, you get that by playing over and over and over with the guy next to you. You know, James Daniels and Cody White here in early part of the season, you know, they struggled with stunts, you know, for whatever reason. I mean, those guys have played a lot of football in, in, in their careers, but for whatever reason, early in the year, just because they weren't used to those positions, they really struggled with stunts. And then, you know, it, it, they started getting a little more comfortable as the year went on, but then they switched them again. And then it took them a little while longer again to get comfortable. So, you know, you talk about James Daniels, and I, I know a, a little earlier, you know, I was looking at some clips he just sent me, and a lot of the stuff I see from Daniels from his mistakes it really just looks like he's thinking too much. You know, there, there's times when he's pulling and he looks really tentative, almost like he's not sure where the hole's going to be, where he has to come up the field. Um, other times when I, I see him when he goes to the second level, um, there's instances where he's just not sure of who he's going to attack. And then when he does attack the guy on the second level, he's kind of aiming where, where the player is instead of where he's going to be. So he ends up oversetting and he ends up missing the block entirely. And on film, it looks like he just completely whiffed it. But, but I'm sure if you go back and, and, and you watch it with, with the coaches, you know, he's going to tell the coaches that he was just thinking about it. And, and you know, we talk about it with a lot of the players, you know, when you're thinking, you're not affected. When you're reacting to what's happening and it's, it's second nature, that muscle memory, then you're a good player. And I think James Daniels talks about his age, you know, but he'll get there. And that makes sense to me. I know I can make sure, because we've talked a little bit about Daniel's struggles, and I want to make sure that we at least mention his strengths, especially in at left guard. His pass blocking reps can be nothing short of phenomenal on occasion. I mean, there's nothing more beautiful, and you taught me this personally. I know, wide receiver cuts are beautiful. Deep, gorgeous touchdown bombs they're beautiful but when you're staring at an offensive lineman and his man comes at him and he gets those hands inside the defensive lineman's pads and that guy just doesn't move that's a beautiful thing like no pressure back on the quarterback just a gorgeous rep and Daniels has turned in quite a few of those and made a name for doing so against none other than Aaron Donald last year not this year Donald destroyed the Bears but the point is 
I, I totally see what you mean. I think Daniels has a lot to like in his game, especially when he moved to left guard against Kansas City, against Detroit, against plenty of other teams. He was making run blocks that he just wasn't making earlier in the year at center, and you can tell he felt more comfortable. Maybe he was thinking less. I don't really know. But one thing that I'll move on with, just to make sure that we really get your full opinion on the offensive line, talk about Cody Whitehair, and then tell me about Rashad Coward. Yeah, I think with white hair, again, he struggled kind of early. I think part of it was just moving around. And and, and it's, it's funny because you look at him, you know, I think it was the second year in the league, he played all three spots on in, in, in the interior. And, and, and you know, I talk about it all the time. You know, we, we've talked about it quite a bit. And, and, and when you have your guys, you know, put him in one spot and that's it. He stays there for the rest of his life. Don't move him ever. And, and I think with Cody Whitehair, you know, whether it's it's the reason he was going back to center was just because of Mitch Trubisky and the struggles he had with the pass pro, or if there really was a comfort level um, there, you know, whatever the reason, the Bears often seemed to play a little better, you know, once they made the switch. Um, it, it took time to get used to it. But I think with Cody White here, he has that Pro Bowl ability. He, he made it a couple years ago. Um, he, he struggled a bit, you know, this this last season, you know, but, but he plays with good technique. Um, he, he has really good strength at the point of attack. And then Cody White here, again, if he, if he stays at that center spot, I think he could have a chance to be back in the Pro Bowl this season. That makes sense to me. I mean, Cody Whitehair has been a standout at the center position even as soon as he started playing it. And don't get me wrong, I like him at left guard too. I actually think he might even be a better left guard. But comparing Whitehair at left guard and Daniels at center to Daniels at left guard and Whitehair at center, I don't think that there's much of a choice. The latter is the much better option and certainly one that I trust going forward regardless of who is at quarterback. But it's that right guard spot I think needs some tension in the 2019 or 2020 season, don't you think? Yeah. Before I head on, on Riker, let me, let me go real quick touch on uh, kind of the left guard in the center. You know, one, the reason why the Bears started Daniels at guard as a rookie is because of his, his, he's such a good athlete. You know, the occasion the Bears are going to run some power scheme in there and they're going to they're pull that guard around or they're going to get him out in front on screens and, and they pull their guards a little more than they pull the center. So if Daniels is your guard, you know, moving forward, his athleticism should let him shine at that spot. And then speaking of athleticism, you know, last year we did not see that out of the right guard spot, whether that was uh, with Kyle Long early, who just struggled, you know, with injuries. Uh, Ted Larson is just a, basically a, a serviceable player. But then with Shad Coward got the ball for the reps and, and he looked okay. His team when he came in against the Vikings, uh, he was strong at the front of the back. Um, he was pretty good in pass pro that game as well. But it looked like as soon as uh, opposing teams saw him on film they realized where he struggled they realized they can trick him with stunts and trick him with slants uh, they did that and he really struggled the rest of the season which is why the Bears went out and signed uh, 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 Jermaine Afridi between Kyle Long who unfortunately seemed to see his body just completely give way and Rashad Coward I can't tell you Bears fans and Lester how much I saw that right guard spot be a problem for the Bears whether on runs or passes but especially in the running game it really seemed as if those interior defensive linemen were eating the right guard for lunch and when that's happening on somewhere between 30 35 maybe even 40 percent of snaps there's only really one word for it and it's unacceptable because offensive line unfortunately is an all-in or all-out position Lester I know you've talked about it before but especially in the case of the 2019 Bears there were so many instances and I think you were even saying Harry Heastan talked about this of four guys getting it right and one guy getting it wrong and by default it was often Rashad Coward or Kyle Long and it's something that I would hope Jermaine Effady can at least help remedy in the 2020 season. Yeah, you know, we were talking a little bit a little earlier, and, and that's it was either either he stat or Halfrich. I know early in the season, you know, one of the offensive coaches did mention that you know they would all give have everything right except for one guy. It was often one guy that sits the right guard spot, and with 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 the new guy they got coming in, Afridi, you know, his his guard tape that I watched from, from Seattle was his rookie year. So he was just really raw. I mean, that was his his first time playing guard. He was a tackle in college for the most part. Uh, so when the Seahawks put him at right guard, he was really a, a raw player. His technique was sloppy. Uh, he would lean into his blocks at times. He wouldn't move his feet with him. And and he has the size and he has the athleticism to, to, to man the position. But 
he wasn't the best uh, at right guard at that time. We saw flashes. Um, he obviously was better than what we saw with Coward a year ago because uh, he is a, a, a longtime offensive lineman. But with a Freddie, you know, he, he's at one of these guys where he just got, again, get him in a spot, never move him again. You know, whether the Bears keep him here long term or he just plays it, you know, for this season and he moves on, um, I think he's going to be serviceable enough uh, to, to get the offensive through in 2020. I'll tell you what, if there's one thing that comes to mind when I watch Jermaine Ifedi's tape, it's strength and slow feet. So obviously one of those is a positive and one of them is a negative, but in the same way that Bobby Massey can be a bit slow in terms of how he moves his feet, and certainly it led to problems against teams like San Diego, Jermaine Ifedi is great when inside the phone booth that guard presents, because he's got help on his left and right side between the center and the right tackle, but where this really stands out is is Jermaine Ifedi couldn't be any more different than the large majority of the Bears offensive linemen. If I looked at James Daniels, Charles Leno, two beautiful examples of what I'm about to illustrate, I think you'd agree, Lester, they're better pass protectors than they are run blockers. And that's exactly why if Bears fans got their wish of anything, they wanted a run demon. They wanted somebody similar to Kyle Long, the guy who Kyle Long had been, who was just a mauler in the run game and set the tone for what they were going to do. And I'll tell you what, if I am going to take an optimistic approach on Efedi, that guy can hit people in the run game. And going all the way back to the rookie tape that he showed, even as a 22-year-old on the Seahawks, I saw him jostling with people post-play, mugging people in the run game. He's got a mean side to him, and if he can bring that to the Bears, especially coming off of a couple of years at tackle where he might want to change the outlook of his name, that could be really helpful for a Bears running game that has been in the bottom four, bottom five of the league the last two years running and desperately needs to improve. Yeah, we, if, if he was being signed to be the swing tackle or the, or the compete with Massey at right tackle, um, I would not like the signing at all. But the fact that the Bears are content on moving it back inside the guard, um, I think that's the, the best thing for him. And you mentioned his mean streak. You know, the, the, the stuff I watched from him at guard as well, you know, like a lot, a lot of times I said his technique wasn't sound, but he was just so aggressive with what he was trying to do that sometimes that's all he needed. You know, he didn't make the perfect block or, or, or everything he did with his feet wasn't perfect, you know, but he has the size and the strength. And, and when he gets on you, you know, the block's pretty good there. So with him and with, with a, a, a uh, Bobby Massey coming back on the right side, you know, that should be a pretty strong run blocking side for the Bears. Um, and then we'll see how they, they want to work stuff going across the other way. But, you know, that, that, that's old school tradition right there. You're, the guys on your right side are usually your, your better run blockers. And, and if that's what's going to happen here with the Bears, then let's do it. I'll tell you what, Lester, I'm really curious to see how Bobby Massey does shape out because especially as I was diving deep on Leno's footage, the one thing that kept seeming to come up is that Bobby Massey is right at the age where his decline in terms of common tackle age decay is supposed to be in flight by now. And it seemed as if Bobby Massey took a bit of a step back from what he showed in 2018 in 2019, and that has me a bit discouraged because if he takes another step back, he could suddenly find himself at backup tier, primarily because of the slow feet that we talked about a little bit earlier. But I don't know. Do you have faith in Bobby Massey? What do you think? Yeah, I'm not sure if faith is the right word for Massey. I mean, I, I, I've always been a guy that's, that's kind of looked at Massey for what he is. I'm not expecting him to come in and be one of these these, these top tier right tackles. You know, I mean, he is what he is. I mean, he's he's pretty good in the run game. You know, in, in, the, in the past game, you know, you can beat him with speed, but that's most right tackles in the league. You know, not every right tackle is, is a guy like Storch or KC <laughs> where they just come in and, they, and, and they're locked down guys. You know, most right tackles just, just aren't as good as the guys on the other side of the, of, of the O-line there. So, you know, with Massey, you talk about his feet. You know, the one thing with him is, is you know, he's a veteran, so he knows he doesn't have the, the, the quickest of feet. So so one thing he'll try and do is he'll try and get his hands on the, on the guy in defense a little quicker uh, because he knows he has a, a really strong strong grip if you can get in, in you know in, in the pads and, and and make his his move early you know that's that's better for him for making the pass block you know his problem is you know much like it was with, with Freddy you know is is the angles aren't right you know if, if they can't get his hands on you if there's too much space between him and and the defender that defender's gonna make a move and, and juke can get around him you know Massey has to get his hands on you but the problem the Bears had last year is they were having problems on 
left tackle and right tackle. You know, if you if you realize that you have to give one of your sides some chip help once in a while, uh, a tight end, a back, whatever it is, you know, just just someone there just to make that defender think, you can get away with it doing on one side. If you got to help both sides in a line, you know, that's that's a recipe for disaster. Makes total sense to me. And who knows, maybe Jason Spriggs surprises us, but it won't surprise me if that's going to be our starting five going forward. So I guess that leaves us with the final question. Uh, are you satisfied with the Bears 2020 offensive line? Do you think that Juan Castillo is going to be able to inject some energy into these guys and we'll see them bounce back to, I mean, ideally the 2018 pass protection level and a more Castillo style running game that has commonly been successful almost every single other stop he's been in the NFL. So what do you think, Lester? Give it to me straight. Is this offensive line in a place that you're happy with? Or do you want to see a little bit more upgrade, given that Larry Warford and Kevin Osimile, Khaleesi Osimile, are still out there on the market? Yeah, I would have liked to see a little better player at right guard. Um, but, you know, this is what the Bears want to do. They feel that, for the most part, they have a, a unit in place they like. They paid Leno. Uh, they paid Massey. They paid Whitehair. They drafted Daniels. So they feel they have enough guys in place. You know, we talked about earlier in the show, that for whatever reason, the, the run game didn't click last year. You know, uh, the, the head coach kind of, you know, by by their actions, you know, they kind of put the blame on on the the offensive staff. You know, he brings bringing in all his guys now. They're all guys that, that he's worked with before. They're all guys that have have some sort of uh, knowledge in, in the scheme and the system. You know, with Castillo, you know, you mentioned, you know, he's worked in this specific scheme before. He's worked with Nagy before. He's worked with Coach Reed before. You know, so he knows exactly what they want to do. Um, you know, he's going to get the most out of these guys and. You know, it's not that Harry Heastan wasn't a good O-line coach because he is one of the best, but I just think that there's like an unspoken uh, thing with, with if you already understand the scheme, you know the scheme like the back of your hand, you know, him and Nagy know what each other want to do without even having to say it, but kind of cuts down some of that. You know, there is going to be no feeling out process, you know, so I think with Juan Castillo, is, is he going to be the, the only reason why this O-line is better? I think he's going to have to. He, that's a good way to put it. He's going to have to be, but I am optimistic. I mean, for crying out loud, the Bears run scheme last season was something that I don't think I've ever seen a run scheme look more convoluted, more lost in identity. I mean, the run scheme in particular, the pass scheme, you could tell what they wanted to do. They wanted to get guys the ball in space. They wanted to give the quarterback simple one, two reads that change between single high and double high safeties. But in the run game in particular, I saw power concepts, I saw pin and pull, I saw inside and outside zone. The Bears seem to try everything. And at some point, you have to know what you're trying to do. And certainly I hope that with Juan Castillo, the Bears may very well find that. And truth be told, when it comes to their running game, you kind of can't go anywhere else but up, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, right now the Bears were, you know, I'm not sure where they were for the numbers, but I know uh, with Cohen. 29th. 29th, according to Football Outsiders. You know, with Cohen, I think he averaged 3.3 yards per carry. Uh, 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 the, the rookie Montgomery, he averaged, you know, I think less than four yards per carry. 3.6. <laughs> you know, so I mean, that's not that's not going to get it done in the NFL, and especially if you're if you are, well, you know, what the Bears want to do, they want to be a, a pass first offense. You know, they want to use that, that that old school West Coast offense where they're using the the, the short pass kind of as a running game, but that should help open up some lanes for the runners too. You know, this is a, a, a run pass option. You know, they want, they want to do a, a bunch of that stuff. And again, we're going to go back to the quarterback. You know, some of that stuff falls on the quarterback making the right reads. Some of that falls on if, if, if he's able to make the right decision to hand off or not hand off, you know, who knows if, if some of those, those poor runs that, that we saw last year, you know, if, if the guy's making a bit better decision in 2020, those may go for bigger runs now. I can't believe that we're running up on time so much as we are, but I do have to mention it. You talked about the quarterback potentially pulling the trigger on different run and run pass options. But another thing I want to talk about is whether it's Nick Foles or Mitch Trubisky, I do hope the quarterback helps their offensive line out a little bit more because as I'm sure you know, as the creator of Windy City Gridiron's sack watch going through every single sack, Mitch Trubisky certainly didn't make things easy on the offensive line. And I think it's part of the reason they get so much heat in terms of how Bears fans view them because, yes, of course, they allowed plenty of sacks. 
but it sure seemed as if a lot of those were avoidable, and hopefully not just the offensive line's actual play steps up, but the quarterback can help them out too, and we say, see a lot less quarterback pads hitting the dirt in 2020. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things where, you know, it's it's it all goes hand in hand. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I started sack watch is because whenever a sack happens, you know, the immediate thought from the casual fan is, you know, all the the, the, the guy missed the block. But, but but sometimes it's not as simple as, as as the left tackle making a mistake. Sometimes it's it's the it's the running back, you know, failing to chip a guy when he was expecting a chip to come, or, or it's it's the quarterback, you know, not seeing the, the hot blitz, knowing that he has to get the ball out of his hands as fast as possible because there's a a, a guy that's not being blocked. So, you know, it's was the O-line bad in pass for last year? Of course, you know, they, they took a step back, obviously. You know, but anyone that doesn't want to recognize that the, the failings from the quarterback spot had a hand in that, it's just, they're just, they're just, they're just uh, full of it. I, I tend to agree with you. I think there's improvement areas all across the team, but certainly offensive line is one that I would hope that they're able to rebound. Lester, it has been fabulous having you on for as my first guest. Go ahead and let the viewers know where they can find your work online, and I'll let you go. WindyCityGridiron.com. Of course, we have a great podcast that you're on as well. Thanks. Um, I jump on there once in a while. We have three great shows that are always running all the time, so make sure you check that out. And then, of course, I'm on Twitter at WiltFongJR. And Bears fans, that's about going to wrap it up. It's been a longer episode of RPO, but I'm excited about the analysis that we were able to bring you. So if you like this video, please like it down below and comment as well. Any engagement helps. And it all feeds into the YouTube algorithm that helps promote this channel and let Bears fans all over the internet know just how well the offensive line did and didn't do in 2019 and what we expect for 2020. If you like what I have to say, be sure to follow me over on Twitter, find my podcast, on Windy City Gridiron, like Lester mentioned. And until next time, Bears fans, bear down, and thanks so much for bearing with me.